Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. this lecture 36 with the thought passes from rocket scientist Herman Obert, who had given a statement in way back in 1923. He, uh, he had told that the rockets can be built so powerful that they would be capable of carrying a man after aloft, right. That means, aloft means basically floating, right. So, if you look at, at that time, people were having knowledge of rocket, but that was too tiny to really do anything. And if you go back to the history, Indians and Chinese were basically good at making rocket and using for warfare also. And uh, if you look at, we are having a very ambitious uh, satellite launch uh, vehicle program or space program for which we have uh, designed several of launch vehicles. Of course, the latest one is the GSLV that is geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle. If you look at these uh, rocket vehicles, what you can note here that means, these are all rocket 1, 2, 3, 4 like that you know these are the nozzle if you look at this rocket is known as Strapan rocket motors, right. And this central one is having, you know, several stages, like in the generally the initial stages will be booster and also the Strapan will be also for the booster rocket. Booster means, whenever you start from the ground, you need to overcome a lot of inertia, right. For that, you need to give a very high level of thrust, right. So, that you can in motion and then after that of course, uh, the staging is being used, which I will not be discussing. That means, you will first you know give a very high thrust and it will move. Then, this strapan will be separated out and it will be detached from the vehicle. So, also the some of the uh, stages and uh, you know main thing is this is your payload, right. And as it goes on, to get a very high velocity, you need to eject the uh, you know first stage, second stage, third stage you know like generally GSLV will be having th three stages of which you know rocket engine. And why those stages are required? As I told, it is meant for to get a very high velocity, so that you can put the satellite in certain high orbit, right, because the velocity injection velocity will be very high. And if you want to escape from the earth gravitational pull, then you will have to go to a very high velocity escape velocity. For that, you need to have a you know very high velocity, uh, which you cannot get with the whole rocket vehicle. So, therefore, you need to reduce. And uh, I would not be discussing about that part, particularly what will be trajectory, what will be maximum. But from the point of view flight mechanics and also requirement of the engine design, right. So, what I will be doing, I will be looking at uh, basically the various aspects of the combustion and then burning of propellants and then nozzle and expansion other thing, those aspect we will be looking at. That means, we know our uh, what you call requirements and then we are looking for it, right and we want to see what is the how to you know go about and what are the processes involved during combustions and all those things we will be looking at. So, as I told you earlier that rocket engine you know is basically will be chemical uh, rocket engines and it can be also solar, it can be also electrical, it can be thermal, it can be nuclear right. And uh, if you look at uh, this we have uh, had visited this propel classification of propulsive devices earlier, right. And rocket engine comes under non air breathing engine, 
and in the earlier lectures we have discussed about air breathing units, right? Particularly this ramjet, turbojet, turbofan, and turboprop engines. All those things we had discussed in last lecture, several series of lectures, and we had carried out cycle analysis, right? But now we will be concentrating only on the thermal, or I call it chemical, you know, rocket engines and this chemical rocket engines is divided into three categories. One is solid propellant rocket engines and liquid propellant rocket engines and hybrid propellant rocket engines. We will be trying to look at you know uh, all these three aspects very briefly, right. So, therefore, uh, uh, you know we will be looking at detail about this thing. And before really doing that, we need to look at general the rocket engine and its performance. Some of the performance parameter we have already seen, but we will visit some of them. To start with, we will look at the what to call chemical power rocket engines, right. And as I told that this is a solid propellant and uh, just to distinguish how it is different and what are the advantages and disadvantages. We won't be discussing now, but I'll give you the overall view. Like if you look at solid propellant, is basically it is ignitable and self-sustaining fuel. That means you can ignite. Once you ignite, you know, you can't really it stop it. It is difficult. Generally, rocket uh, solid rocket engine. However, that means it is difficult to extinguish the flame, right? And it will be have a lower performance than the liquid rocket engines and low specific impulse. What is the specific impulse we will be defining, right? And uh, all those things. Keep in mind that the simple and it is quite simple and no moving parts. Like unlike your uh, liquid uh, propellant engine where there will be some moving parts, we will see that. And it is uh, can be uh, you know bipropellant, it can be monopropellant, bipropellant means one is liquid uh, you know oxidizer other is liquid fuel that is bipropellant and it can be both together you know that is known as monopropellant right we'll be discussing little bit about those things and uh, if you look at it is you know two liquid propellant as i told it is bipropellant and the high level of combustion efficiency order of 99% efficient you can get because it can mix the liquid uh, and then vaporize and very easily unlike a solid which is difficult to burn you know like so but it is quite expensive to design especially the pumps and they use thermal flux across the combustors right if you uh, when you will go to the liquid propellant engine you will see how complex it is it is not as simple as what we had seen in the very beginning of lecture some schematic right that is not that simple, but it is quite complex. And beside this, the hybrid, which is a basically combination of solid and liquid, that means the solid will be the fuel and liquid will be the oxidizer, right? But it can also be vice versa, but the first one is being more preferred. So, that is known as hybrid rocket engine, and which will, uh, you know, as I told, oxidizer will be liquid and the fuel will be solid. And it is quite safe to use because fuel be behaves like an inert whenever you know it is devoid of oxidizer. That means if oxidizer is not there, then you know it will be as inert as any other thing. So it is uh, that's why it is quite safe. Whereas the uh, what you call liquid propellants and other things. Huh? Solid propellant, we'll be looking at uh, like you know uh, there will be uh, double base propellant and then composite propellants. All those things we'll be looking at that, right? <coughs> and solid propellant, but sometimes uh, what will happen? The solid propellant can be broken, of course, not in a regular way due to some malfunctioning, and then some portion it can go and block the rocket nozzle, right? If it will nozzle, then what will happen? then pressure will build up and then you know it will go astray sometimes it may lead to the explosion as well right but the generally that is not being ever i mean that is not being uh, really occur where properly designed but disaster can happen any time you know so therefore one has to be 
careful about this uh, while designing. So, if you look at this is the uh, basically I have given some overall view of the chemically power rocket engine which can be broadly divided into solid propellant engine, rocket engine, liquid propellant rocket engine and hybrid rocket engine. So, what we will do now is basically look at all these three rocket engines what we call chemical uh, rocket engines and uh, those things performance we need to look at it and which we have already seen like the thrust and other things, but we look at little different perspective. So, if you look at the rocket engine we will be having two components, what are those components? One is thrust chamber, other is your nozzle. So, if you look at this is this portion, if you look at this portion is basically the thrust chamber, this is your thrust chamber. and this is your nozzle right which is given nozzle like see there are two component one is thrust chamber right what we call combustion chamber right and other is your nozzle nozzle generally conversion diversion nozzle is being used unlike your you know toy rocket what we use in the valley and other thing it will be having not any conversion diversion may a simple hole will be there you might have seen when uh, you know you, uh, you might have played during your childhood about rock, rocket what we call you know toy rockets for the spire, uh, for the fire crackers kind of thing right. So, but generally the conversion diversion nozzle being used of course, there are several other kinds of nozzle which are, uh, have come up in recent time like plug flow nozzles and other things which we would not be discussing, but uh, so if you look at the thrust equation as we have already derived for the air breathing engines right. For non air breathing what it will be having? Because no flow is coming in right, all this propellant is inside. So, therefore, the momentum drag due to the propellant input or in will be 0. So, we will get a an expression as thrust is equal to m dot p that is the total uh, what you call flow rate of propellant which will be consisting of both oxidizer and pro and fuel and V e is the exit velocity, this is your V e exit velocity right. And there is a pressure thrust uh, you know thrust due to the expansion in nozzle P e minus P a into A e and this is what you call the momentum thrust right, thrust due to momentum and this one is your pressure thrust. And what difference you could get? The difference is there that is the drag right, inlet momentum drag is 0 in this case right, but whereas the in the air breathing engine the thrust will be basically for air breathing engine you know. The thrust will be m dot uh, you can say p v e minus m dot uh, you know not v naught plus p e minus p a a e right. This is basically 0 in case of rocket engine right for rocket engine. So, therefore, that comes around to be here. Now, when we uh, thought about this thing and we know very well that when nozzle is fully expanded that is P e is equal to P a we will get the maximum thrust right. So, that is the maximum thrust will be equal to m dot P v e and uh, if you look at this thrust whether it is having a pressure component or the pressure ch change in the nozzle or you know when it is fully expanded it will be dependent on what this thrust will be dependent on altitude right is not it. Because your V e will be decided by the what pressure it will be that means this P a this is P e, but P a which is the ambient air it will be dependent on the altitude. As you go along the height of the, uh, along the altitude, so it is the pressure goes on decreasing right is not it. So, when you will go to the very very deep space 
ideally it will be 0, right vacuum ideally. So, therefore, uh, if you look at the, the thrust will be varying with altitude that means, if I take this thrust it will be let us say with the 105 kilo Newton it will be goes on and after that you know certain it will remain almost asymptotically increasing that means, there is not much change and uh, it will be remaining almost constant right for a very high altitude. And of course, the ISP will be similar because ISP can be related to the thrust that we will see in a moment right. So, now what we will see we will uh, look at certain definitions and other things what we will be using as a performance parameter. So, the specific impulse if you look at can be defined as the impulse per unit weight of the propellant. That means, how much impulse you can give whenever certain amount of propellant is being you know ejected out from the nozzle right. So, by uh, definition it will be I s p is equal to I divided by the mass of the propellant into the g like g is the gravity generally in the sea level we will be using. So, if you look at I s p I can uh, what is this impulse? Impulse will be uh, you know thrust indicated over the time that is from 0 to the T b this is a burning time, burning type of what? Burning type of propellant right whatever it is right. And uh, then and what is this m p? m p is the total uh, propellant being burned during this time what you call during the time 0 to T b or the duration of the burning right. So, then m p will be m dot p d t integrated over the 0 to T b time you know the integrated over the time 0 to T b. So, if you look at i will be if I put this thrust expression without considering the pressure component right that we are doing or I can say I can write down this thrust you know as m p v e plus uh, p e minus p a a e is equal to m dot p v equivalent right. This is equivalent velocity which has taken care of this term also right. So, if you put that thing uh, m dot p and then uh, if I say that this v equivalent is not changing over the time, is it really possible? Huh? It is not really possible when it is moving because your p e and p a will be changing, but you can assume that variation except at the initial stage and the rest of the time it is not varying as you have seen that thrust you know is not changing along with altitude of certain this thing right. We have seen in the last uh, slide. So, if we assume that then you can say it is not changing much, but in real situation it would not be it will be some finite change ok. So, therefore, I I can write down this m dot p d t will be nothing but m p that is total propellant of mass right. And then I can write down I s p you know will be when I substitute these values over in equation this what I am getting instead of this I will get m p v equivalent. So, this is cancel it out. So, I will get I s p is v equivalent by g and if I put the definition of this you know thrust into m dot p I will get I s p is basically proportional to thrust and inversely proportional to the mass flow rate of propellant through the nozzle right. And of course, the g is the gravity what we take in the sea level right, but uh, when you take to other places you can also do that right. <laughs> so, this is a one ISP, but there is a another where people do not consider g even right ok. And uh, if when you consider the g then you know the unit of this ISP will be in second right this will be in second yes or no right. If you look at this is the thrust, thrust is the force Newton right. Newton means kg and meter per second square right. If you look at let me write down here this will be kg 
meter per second square and this is kg per second right and into this is meter per second square. So, this is we will cancel it out kg kg cancel it out and this is nothing but your second right. So, the ISP is in second provided you are using g otherwise it is not right. So, in some book you may find it is not considered g because if you go to the space what g you will consider that is the that is why some people use with certain unit, but mostly it is used as a you know. V equivalent what I am saying, I am saying that this total M p that means, V equivalent will be I can write down here, V equivalent will be V e plus p e minus p a a equivalent divided by m dot p that is my V equivalent right. So, I can say this is equivalent and when p e is equal to p a this is nothing but exit velocity is same as the V equivalent. That is just from that expression, right. So, of course, um, I have already talked about this V equivalent is assumed to be constant and uh, of course, during this burning period and T V is the burned out time. Burned out time means whatever it has taken to burn, of course, it is being very much used in case of a solid propellant, but in liquid you can till it uh, you know you close the valve, it will be that way or till you terminate the uh, operation. ISP keep in mind that ISP does not depend on the flight velocity, right, because your thrust is not depending on flight velocity. So, therefore, ISP would not be depending on the flight velocity, right, it is a very simple one, right. So, but ISP indicates the performance of the rocket engine. Whenever we talk about performance of rocket engine, we always use the ISP and ISP with G of course mostly, but nowadays people are you know using without g that is thrust divided by m dot p right, which will be having the unit of uh, what to call that is uh, uh, you know like uh, if I multiply it by this meter per second it will be in that unit or you can say Newton per kg per second you can say unit. You see that uh, what I am doing like uh, I s p if you look at I am using this uh, no if you look at what is the thrust thrust is equal to v equivalent is basically what v equivalent the thrust is equal to m dot p into v equivalent right. So, v equivalent will be thrust divided by m dot p. So, I put it t by m dot p is that clear. Is that clear? So, uh, if you look at let us look at the ISP of various solid propellant, liquid propellant and hybrid propellant kind of engine right. ISP will be 2 uh, and the solid propellant rocket engine will be varying from 200 to 310 and whereas, the liquid will be having little higher values 300 to 460 and hybrid of course, uh, 300 to 500, but generally people consider the ISP of the hybrid engine is between the solid and liquid, it is rather lower than the liquid right, but some people are claiming it is even beyond that, that is a again not very clear, but generally uh, the ISP of hybrid engine will be in the range of liquid rocket engines kind of thing, but particularly it is lower than the uh, cryogenic engines right, but higher than the other. So, that is the thing and solar of course, it is very high values if you go for nuclear it is much higher, electrical it is much higher right, but keep in mind that these engines will be having very higher specific impulse, but the thrust level is very very low. You cannot really you know uh, lift something from the this thing, if it is something let us say you are having a payload or a some small satellite or something it is moving or you are sending a probe to some other place you can use this kind of other thing, but you cannot really take from the earth you know it is impossible. Even tiny thing to use this solar nuclear uh, of course, nuclear may be, but at least electrical and solar all those things not possible. So, if you look at ISP I have already we have already seen how it is varying with altitude. If you look at 
that is uh, basically if you look at it is uh, varying with this like uh, that means ISP is uh, goes on increasing and it remain almost constant at a higher altitude. So, it is a similar to the thrust you know which we have already seen. So, uh, if you look at a higher ISP means what means is basically better performance of the rocket engine because it could impart more impulse to the vehicle or to the space vehicle or the rocket engines. Of course, rocket engine can be used for missile application as well which is not good, but it is being used right. So, if you look at the specific impulse, well, let us look at how it is varying with the uh, altitude and as we have already seen that you know uh, for uh, you know altitude it is not really uh, you know changing at after certain altitude. But what happens when the uh, flight velocity changes because when you are you know having a rocket engines which will be moving from the very low velocity to the very high velocity or flight velocity will be changing right. And what happens to ISP and what about the ISP of other um, air breathing engines that we will see. Like if you look at the air uh, you know specific impulse is being plotted with the flight Mach number you know. So, this is basically flight Mach number and you can see that uh, these are the turbo jet engines the blue color is for hydrocarbon fuel which is being used generally ok. And the red color is for the hydrogen which is hypothetical not, I mean nowhere it is being used as of now ok. But in future people may go for it because of course, in scramjet engine and uh, you know people are using the uh, thinking of using hydrogen ok. So, if you look at it is changing with respect to the flight Mach number for the turbo jet and ramjet is also changing right from the very high ISP right. And of course, uh, the scramjet engine is having a uh, much lower ISP as compared to turbo jet, but again it is changing a little bit you know kind of things. But where the beauty of this rocket engine it is independent of the flight Mach number. So, that is the beauty of, but however, a beauty of the rocket engines, but however, the its value is very, very low. That means, you know to give a uh, what to call a impulse or a take off thrust and other thing is you know is a very limiting right kind of things. So, uh, therefore, you know turbo Z uh, what people are thinking why not combine this cycle. That means, you start with uh, maybe uh, uh, with a uh, air breathing engines and then go to the rocket kind of thing whenever you will be. So, that you can manage well right. So, that is a combined cycle what people are talking about there are several permutation you know combination people are contemplating to use in future particularly whenever uh, you are going for very high speed propulsion system kind of things. So, which we would not be discussing, but uh, what I want to uh, you know urge you people to keep in mind that you know the limitation of the rocket engine and also those limitation how you can use and what is the uh, good about considering the ISB as a performance parameter. So, let us look at the nozzle components you know because to get this ISP or get the thrust ISP means specific impulse you basically have to depend upon the nozzle and we will be considering the ideal nozzle. And uh, keep in mind that ideal nozzle performance uh, which will be uh, differed from the actual one by 1 to 6 percent right. So, therefore, if you manage to look at ideal it may be good enough for your design calculations kind of thing. So, let us look at uh, a typical rocket engines and it is irrespective of the propellant being used in general you know rocket engine. The station 1 the propellant is in and then of course, the 2 it is the thrust chamber end of the thrust chamber or the combustion chamber. This is basically combustion chamber you can say it is a thrust chamber right. And this portion is the nozzle right nozzle will start from here somewhere right. 
and it is having a throat, throat I am using as a star, sometimes I will be using as a T, A T, right. It can be I am using as a A star or which is same as A T, I am using, right. In some book people use only a star, so and exit value. Now, what we will do? We will be basically looking at the assumption we will make. What are those assumptions we are saying? We are saying this is quasi one dimensional steady inviscid and adiabatic flow. Actually, if you look at the flow will be in these directions, you know, if from the nozzle it will be like that, but what we are assuming the flow is basically in this direction, right. There will be some component which will be lost, which we are not considering keep in mind. And homogeneous working fluid, which is not really possible in real situation, because you are using liquid, you are using solid and then there will be you know some of the things which will be remaining unburnt and then it cannot be homogeneous, right. And we are also assuming the frozen or the flow, that means it is all chemical equilibrium it is being achieved. It is good enough, but it is not really the reality reality will be there, some of the things will be occurring even in the nozzle, right. And of course, ideal gas law, we can uh, say it will be valid, although the pressure is high, but temperature is equally high. So, therefore, we can assume and there is no shock formation in the nozzle or in the expansion wave, which will be depending on whether it is over expanded, under expanded kind of nozzle and which one has to undergo, a nozzle has to undergo when it is moving, but we are not assuming. And start up, this is start, start, start up, that means it is taking a very less time to start, but in rocket propellant engine it takes a lot of time, you know, much uh, higher as compared to the others, right. So, therefore, it is an uh, assumption. And as I told in the very beginning, axially directed velocity, that means all velocity is coming from axially, but in real situation it is not from the exit of the nozzle. So, therefore, with this we will just apply the first law of thermodynamic between station 1 and station 2, we will get S T T 2 is equal to S T 1 plus delta S C, that means heat of combustion, right, added. And uh, we are assuming the change in kinetic energy, change in potential is 0, steady flow process, all those things were no work being done, right. So, those assumptions we have already made. So, it will be coming to that. So, if you divide this thing and uh, by C p, you know, because I will assume that C p is not changing with temperature, but which is not a really good assumption. You know that C p will be varying if it is, you know like a cold kind of thing and it is a hot and the temperature very much. But in case of a solid propellant, if you look at steady state, it will be also equally hot, right. So, therefore, one can assume that you know it is not varying. So, that is an assumption. So, if you look at if I look at this process as a you know T s diagram, it will look like that you are here and heat being added, right. This heat and as a result the temperature will goes up and this heat being delta S C divided by C p. Keep in mind that here we are assuming combustion efficiency should be 100 percent, which is not true in the real situation. So, then it will be expanded right in a nozzle from 2 to E and you will get the thrust, right. So, therefore, for by applying the first law of thermodynamic between the exit you know E and the station 2, we will get that S T 2 is equal to S T T E, because no heat being added, nothing is happening and we are assuming the flow to be adiabatic in case of nozzle, right, but which need not to be true and it can really not be, because you know like uh, the heat losses particularly in throat region will be much higher as compared to the other places, right. So, but we are doing that and uh, keep in mind that this is basically V square divided by 2 is equal to S T uh, minus H E. So, that will be C P T T 2 minus T E, right. Again the same assumption we are making. So, for an isentropic uh, you know relationship, I can get V E will be basically 2 C P T 2 minus T e and you will find that this is basically uh, you know 
this one and uh, I can write down here this is gamma g and gamma g. So, if you look at this P e divided by P t 2 power to the gamma g and uh, gamma g minus 1. So, this we have already seen and in place of gamma g I can write down in C p I can write down gamma g gamma g minus 1 and this is nothing but your molecular weight and uh, so where T t 2 is the mo, uh, is the uh, what you call temperature this is the chamber temperature T t 2 and uh, and uh, the m this is basically molecular weight. Right. So, from this what you can uh, you know learn is that if I want to have higher V e what I will have to do? I will have to basically lower the molecular weight of the gas which will be expanded in a nozzle and enhance the temperature T t 2 by using proper propellant right and of course, the uh, this portion you know is which will tell me P e by P t 2 will tell me how far it is. That means, when P e is becoming smaller right P e is decreasing what will happen? This term goes on decreasing right. It is and uh, for a particular chamber pressure of course right. So, this term will be go on decreasing. So, that more component from this you will get right. So, for uh, if you look at this is uh, gamma is 1 point uh, this thing 1.4 right and you will find this is gamma divided by gamma minus 1 3.5 that is for A. If you look at this is the term what we are using right, but for whereas the rocket engine we use gamma g as uh, 1 point you know 2. Right. So, that will be basically 6. So, if you look at it is this component you know this portion is 3.5 per A. Now, if you take uh, gamma g 1.2 it becomes 6 right. Of course, it is having also component here is just suppose uh, you know like uh, the same as that. So, that means you know it is goes on and it becomes smaller. So, if you look at it is very important to choose the proper you know gamma for the uh, rocket engines because uh, you can never really use a air unless otherwise you are having air rocket. Can I have air rocket? I can have you know is not it. I can put a air pressure right at a very high a pressure and then pass through a nozzle and I can get a thrust right, but that will be for a temporary one kind of thing. So, depending upon what capacity. So, if you look at this is uh, P t by P e and uh, that is the ratio you know and uh, uh, for a certain values you know V attains a maximum value. That means, if this will be infinity right, when P e is equal to 0, then P t 2 by P e will be infinity. That means, other way around if you look at P e by P t 2 will be 0 is not it. So, if it is 0 this term will be 0 right and then only 1 will be there. So, then uh, we V e will attain a maximum values that is V e to uh, uh, I think V e maximum will get root over 2 g r u uh, this is not g this is gamma g and gamma g minus 1 molecular weight and T t 2. So, what it indicates it indicates that the maximum exit velocity will be dependent on what the temperature it will be dependent on of course, this gamma value which is for a particular propellant system it will be same is not it you can take average. Keep in mind that it is not really the same uh, when it is expanding in a nozzle, but we are assuming it to be constant right. When the gas is expanded for the same propellant right, 
the gamma g will be changing because temperature is changing, right. So, therefore, that changes will be something may be 6 to uh, or maybe 4 to 6 percentage kind of thing, right. right. So, therefore, uh, if we assume this gamma g is will be same, then naturally the it will depend on the chamber temperature or the uh, or the what you call thrust chamber uh, temperature T T 2 and higher it will be T T 2 will be higher the V E will be higher and if V E is higher then naturally I S P will be higher for a same kind of uh, you know uh, system and if the molecular weight is lower then what happen V E this also goes up right and for that you will be using lighter you know uh, propellants particularly for hydrogen and oxygen you know like hydrogen is considered as a better fuel because it is much lighter. So, now uh, having you know done this thing we need to now uh, look at the which is affecting the thrust right we will be defining a thrust coefficient right. Let us recall the thrust equation which we have done already uh, looked at it m dot p and v e plus p e minus p a a e right. And in rocket engine generally the nozzle is choked for most of the time except what except maybe in the beginning right, because it cannot be choked right it will be and the after certain time it become get choked and once choked then you know you cannot really change it unless you change the pressure right. You cannot change the mass flow rate of the propellant which is passing through the nozzle right unless you change the pressure upstream pressure that means combustion chamber or the thrust chamber pressure. So, the expression for the choked mass flow rate can be written as as m dot p is equal to m dot star that I am saying is basically corresponding to the choked condition star is choked condition and p t 2 a star root over gamma divided by r. Uh, T T 2 into 2 plus gamma plus 1 uh, power to the gamma plus 1 divided by 2 gamma minus 1. This we had derived in the very beginning of the class in the first uh, you know few lectures particularly when we are discussing about compressible flow. Now, we will be using it right. So, uh, if you look at we have already derived this is uh, gamma you know uh, kind of things right gamma and we have already derived here gamma minus 1, we have already derived V e right. So, what we will do? We will particularly use this equation 13 and 11 and in the equation 1, club all those things together right. So, if you look at what I am doing, basically this m dot p that is the under choked condition, keep in mind the choke condition it is like this, this is from here right. And this portion is from here and of course, this is your pressure thrust. That means, the thrust can be expressed you know in terms of this right and keep in mind that this we are doing for uh, you know for both under expanded, over expanded or fully expanded because we have not made any you know assumption in there only assumption we have made till now that nozzle is choked right. Now, <coughs> look at this that is basically by we will have to simplify these equations right and uh, what we will do we will have taken a lot of terms inside right. If you look at uh, this thing we have taken some of this term like 2 gamma plus 1 inside you know if I look at this portion will be cancel it out here right. Can I not cancel it out root over R u T t and I can cancel it out and P t u A star and this portion right I can take inside right. <coughs> and keep in mind that this is also cancelled because R u by m dot is nothing but R u by m star is R simply right right. So, therefore, I will cancel it out all. So, then I will uh, you know simplify and then put it okay in the next slide I will do that. So, if you look at I am getting T is equal to P T 2 A star 
S star is nothing but your throat area, right, or the choked condition, right. Uh, of course, uh, need not to be same all the time, but we are assuming that 2 by gamma plus 1 power to the gamma plus 1 divided by gamma minus 1, and this 2 gamma square it has come inside divided by gamma minus 1 into 1 minus p e by p t 2 power to the gamma divided by gamma. Actually, in this case, there is no gamma g as such, right. It is gamma. Why? Because we are not using any air cold, all are hot, right. And we are using only one gamma in case of nozzle, although it is changing, right. That assumption we have already discussed, right. I have already stated that. Although gamma is changing across the nozzle, but that change is very, very minimal and we are not considering. So, by dividing this equation 14 by p t to a star, you know this what we will do? I will just divide this thing a star and this p t 2 by a star, this will cancel it out. What I will get and is known as the thrust coefficient that is c t, right. By definition it is like that thrust coefficient, we are what we are trying to say if you look at uh, this is basically thrust will be produced if the p t 2 pressure will be acting on the nozzle, right, is equal to this portion and also this is of course, comes from momentum and this portion from pressure. So, what it indicates? It indicates that the c t is basically indicates amplification of thrust due to expansion of gas in a nozzle as compared, what is that compared? That if the total P T 2 will be acting on the throat area, right. For example, if there is a conversion nozzle, right. So, what will be the uh, thrust then? That will be simply P T 2 into A T, right. If it is, so this because there is a divergent portion, so therefore, expansion is coming right and you are getting the thrust and this is the portion right. This portion is basically amplification part as compared to the thrust if P t 2 acts on the throat area. Keep in mind that C t that is varies the, the, the thrust coefficient varies from point A to 1 and if it is fully expanded you will get what? Will you get 1 or something different? Okay, I will leave that thing. And keep in mind in practice actual to real C t that means thrust, thrust coefficient is around 0 0.9 of the ideal one, right. So, if you look at actual or the real thrust coefficient will be around of you know 0 0.98 of the ideal one. That means, this is ideal one, this is what? This is ideal, right. How I will get? I will have to conduct experiment and then do that and then get the thrust values, right, by talk, uh, you know, by conducting. Then that will be the actual one, right. This is the idea. And it is not very different from that. So, therefore, it is good enough for you to look at it. And we will see, we will define something and, uh, and keep in mind that this thrust coefficient is function of what? It is the function of P e by P t 2 right and it is P A by P T 2, it is a function of A E by this area, you know throat area or the choked condition, right. And it is a function of also the gamma. That means, this thrust coefficient can be, you know, varied by playing around these parameters. Like when you are designing, you will have to design for certain thing. So, you, at your disposal a exit area and A T will be there and gamma you can uh, think of uh, what you call dip, uh, will be dependent on the kind of propellant you are using. And interestingly, this thrust coefficient is not dependent on the total temperature of the combustion chamber or the thrust chamber, right. Is it there? The term is not there, right. So, which we will be uh, finding out, you know, why not and what really it makes, you know. So, but however, it is dependent on the, the total, you know, pressure like we have already P t 2 is coming over here. So, with this I will stop over and 
we will discuss about the how this is varying and what are the you know uh, how it is varying with this parameter like gamma and p by p t, p a by p t and area ratio in the next class and then we will be discussing about other aspect of solid propellants and other things, right. Okay.